Bless up my people, give thanks alive. In this video, we'll take a look at Philip Paul will pay in tribute to Portia Simpson Miller while making his presentation in the House of Representatives. So, my people, please listen keenly and leave your comment in the comment section below and give thanks for your support. This is a new era for me. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the visionary leadership of our former Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Portia Simpson Miller, who created the first Ministry of Climate Change. And at this time, as we do always, we remember Sister P with love and affection. But because of that, Jamaica is well placed in a future PNP administration. Um, Mr. Speaker, the members' time have been, been expired. I beg to move that it be extended sufficiently for him to conclude his presentation. May it please you, Mr. Speaker. As the request is on the floor, those in favor, those against, eyes of it, you may continue. So, Mr. Speaker, because of that leadership of the former Prime Minister, Jamaica is well placed with a, a new Prime Minister to, to come. Uh, to, to, to restart and to give greater energy and to give greater energy to more coordinated action to the myriads of climate change mitigation and adaptation initiatives that need urgent attention. The truth is, Mr. Speaker, the issue of climate change continues to be one that is dominated by an international perspective and efforts usually ushered in by senior political leadership. Jamaica has not, seen to, has not been seen to continue its international leadership in this regard, certainly not after those heated days when Sister P and Bobby Pickersgill led Jamaica's global articulation. We have lost much of our appeal and influence. Others in our region have overtaken us in terms of the leadership, the leadership of climate change issues. Our vision statement of 2015 is as relevant now as it was then. What is that vision statement? Jamaica achieves its goals of growth and prosperity for its people while meeting the challenges of climate change as a country with enhanced resilience and capacity to adapt to the impacts and to mitigate the causes in a coordinated, effective and a sustainable manner. It was clear to the world, Mr. Speaker, from before the turn of this century that climate change was taking place at an accelerated rate due to human activities, especially those related to the use of fossil fuels and land clearing exasperated by population growth. This level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continues to rise, and despite the tremendous recent efforts to get the entire international community to respond positively, our world remains in danger of cataclysmic impacts due to continuing climate change realities. We know that Jamaica, like so many small island developing states, is particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, not only in terms of our natural resources, but also our social well-being and our economic development. As sectors such as tourism, agriculture, fisheries, forestry, and water are very climate sensitive. Right. Mr. Speaker, we have witnessed the damaging consequences of climate change in Jamaica already, and as soon as we return to office, we'll have to amalgamate all the various projects in a much more coordinated and focused way within the national budget. We have to ensure that the division in the ministry is properly structured, staffed, and resourced, and that we embark on, that we embark on a sustained public education program aimed at all levels of the population and sectors of the economy. We must move from a tagline to a mindset so that our people will fully understand that we are facing real dangers 
that will have far-reaching consequences on things we take for granted. Right. Mr. Speaker, I am unimpressed with the outcome so far of the various climate change project, projects in the ministry. And I'll touch on a few of them. One, we are supposed to increase emission sequestration from the forestry sector. We have not yet, in relation to this project, seen a single divestment, especially in that area dealing with mangrove segment. This has been delayed, and we are asking the question, what has happened to this element of the project? Two, reduce system losses in electricity transmission and distribution. No success here. Three, a switch from fuel oil to energy at energy plant at Alpart Refinery. Well, that plant has been closed for the last few years. Four, improve alumina refinery energy efficiency to 90% by 2030. Nothing has been achieved here. By 2030, Jamaica should have 291 megawatts new solar PV capacity. That has not been achieved. Not one single megawatt has been installed already. As yet, electricity savings of 19,800 megawatt hours by 2030, implementation of that is yet to commence. I can go down the list, uh, every single one of these um, projects are either delayed or not uh, um, started at all. And this again represents a high level of inaction on the part of the government to an area that is critical if we are going to survive. So, Mr. Speaker, I think again in this area, time come. Time come. Mr. Speaker, I'm, a, I'm aware, I'm aware, I'm aware that there is now an extensive investigation being pursued by the Auditor General's Department in the Ministry and all the projects. So I await the conclusion of that investigation by the Auditor General, at which time I will respond further. I'm hoping, though, that when that investigation it's completed by the Auditor General. There will be no delay in tabling it in this Parliament. Mr. Speaker, just a few comments on my role as Leader of Opposition Business in Parliament. As Leader of Opposition Business, I welcome the opportunity to welcome our new Clerk of the House and to pledge my side's full and respective support in her new and important assignment. I also welcome the opportunity to be a part of the committee to undertake a comprehensive review of the Standing Orders um, Committee. I do hope that that exercise, the one to review our Standing Orders, will be vigorously pursued and will be conducted in the highest spirit of compromise and reasonableness. I think as Chairman, the Speaker that is, she, you will have a tremendous responsibility to ensure that the experience and understanding of the committee members, especially those older ones, be fully utilized without too much regard for which side of the aisle they come. Now is not a time for the wielding of the power of the majority, but rather to allow good governance and nation building to take center stage. If, if, if the speaker were here, I would have said to her, Madam Speaker, your role as Speaker has undergone some scrutiny in recent times. And rightly so. As Speaker, you are the impartial, disinterested, fair, even-handed, and reasonable arbiter of the proceedings in this arena. That is a most crucial role and function. It is significant to note that it is, it, it is in only one respect that the Speaker is willing to take part in any active proceedings on this floor. Though no Speaker has exercised the option, the Speaker is only able to participate in a single presentation in the constituency debate. 
Otherwise, the Speaker's role is to ensure the orderly conduct of the House. You have asked, and I am speaking directly to our Speaker, that the standing orders be reviewed to provide you with guidance as to the tabling of reports from the Auditor General and the Integrity Commission. With respect, Mr. Speaker, to you, the rules that currently exist are quite fine and must not be adjusted in any way. What, what we need adjusted, what we need to be adjusted and properly enshrined in our standing orders is that the chairmanship of the several oversight committees should be put back in the hands of the opposition. And we must better define the relationship between the Speaker and the administrative staff of the Parliament. Needless to say, I will again call upon the Speaker to withdraw that egregious letter that was sent to the former That was sent to the former clerk along with an appropriate apology. I believe this matter will dog the Speaker for the rest of her term if she doesn't do the right thing and restore equilibrium and working relationship with this honorable house. In my 27 presentation, I recommended that in addition to the Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition, both the Leader of Government Business and the Leader of Opposition Business should also make our statutory filings and integrity commission subject to public scrutiny. I hope we can agree to that. I did make the initial move in 2017 by publishing my entire, up to that time, 19 years of filings. And I believe that it is good practice. It will be good to add to what the, the leaders are doing if we as the parliamentary leaders do similar. Mr. Speaker, I will now do my acknowledgments. First of all, I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for the continued confidence in me and for the effective leadership of this team. We are 14, but we are very effective inside here. I would like to thank my, my colleagues in our party, but also to all members of this House for the cordial relationship that we continue to share. And Mr. Speaker, earlier the Leader of Government Business acknowledged it, but I want to also single out the former Leader of the Opposition who has now served this Parliament for 30 years. And we want to wish him good health and strength as he continues. I want to say thanks to my two councillors. We again retain our two divisions, um, along with the executive body for the great constituency of Kingston East and Port Royal, chaired by a woman. As, and I have two female councillors. They run things in my constituency. I want to acknowledge, Mr. Speaker, a new addition to the team. We now have a deputy spokesman in the mayor of the great city of Mandeville, and he's here with us, Donovan Mitchell. I thought, I, 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 I thought, I, I, I thought he would come today to be inspired to do the work that he has to do in central Manchester. <laughs> I, I also... You have to pay the first million first. I also, Mr. Speaker, want to acknowledge the junior spokesperson on energy and climate change, Mr. Sajay Palmer, who is also here in the house. As a deputy and a junior, we are training them to take over. Yes, 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 probably so. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, let me also thank, let me also thank the chairman of my task force, Mr. Hugh Campbell, and the team that assists me 
and of course my personal staff at, at my law firm, um, my staff at the constituency office, my driver and security, I want to thank my constituents. I never knew we had so many prayer warriors in East Kingston Port Royal and indeed across Jamaica. I want to thank you so much for all the prayers that the country has set up for me. And of course I want to thank my family and all my friends who have stood by me, especially in these difficult times. Yeah. My family from St. Thomas. Um, I was born in St. Thomas and I do serious political work there now as we try to regain our two seats in that great parish. And it shall be done. Mr. Speaker, in concluding my presentation to, to this Honorable House, I recommit the following desirable and actionable items. We have to return the country to a path to obtain 15% per kilowatt hour for electricity. We have to embrace the provision of solar systems to those in our society who steal um, so that the paying consumers can benefit. We have to table the regulations for the importation, distribution, and use of LNG in Jamaica. And we have to start the negotiations with the JPS in respect of their license. Let's use energy to kickstart the road to greater economic growth. We also have to update the nation on the cabinet decision or lack thereof on the Zaka Petrodon report to ignore such an important cog in the nation's energy security is a neglect of duty of our duty and an irresponsible behavior. We have to put greater urgency and priority to the pressing matter of climate change. We have to restore Jamaica to its leading position and role within the region in respect of climate change issues. To do anything less will lead to our own peril and to leave future generations to suffer because of our avoidable failings. Serving in this Honorable House, Mr. Speaker, is both a privilege and a significant responsibility. The nation watches and sees what we do, and they do so whenever we are here. We can either be a positive beacon of good example or a negative role model to our citizens. Let's put aside our partisan bickering and work to get the work of the Standing Orders Review Committee to significantly improve how we conduct the business of the nation. To do anything less, we would have failed the people who sent us here and, of course, the generations to follow. Despite our warts, Mr. Speaker, we are still a great nation, and our best days are still ahead of us. May God continue to bless Jamaica, land we love. Thank you very much. Closing out for now, this is One Avenue News. Avenue for your news, views, reviews, and much more. New spot on oh, the block where we chat. Looking I forward to the to hear what comment I say. section. <laughs> so click the subscription yes. button, turn on yes. notification yes. Well, bell. Let's journey together. And please remember, we need solution, not confusion. United we win my people, art of love.